welcome uh, Jan Tilekoman or Jagoman as you're known on Discord. Um, so before we get started, do you want to introduce yourself? Who are you? What is your relationship to the language learning community? Okay. Um, yes, well, my, my real name is Joel. <laughs> I'm a translator. Uh, that's my day job. Uh, but over the years, I have tried different learning language methods, language teaching methods, and eventually I've come around to Stephen Crash and the input hypothesis, um, automatic language growth, ALG. And now I've joined the refold discord server and I've been there for a while. Of course, I've been busy with different projects, but I, I really appreciate what refold is trying to do, uh, which, you know, as I see it is trying to make, um, the, the input hypothesis work for solo language learners in the real world. Sure. Taking things that are not comprehensible <clears throat> and making them comprehensible, especially exactly. because most languages, I would argue, do not have an ALG like approach where you can go from zero to a hundred purely with CI. Um, although I guess you could pay people to do it, assuming that you've got trained tutors and you've got uh, a fount of wealth, but that could be expensive. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And you have a sort of a, a YouTube channel. Uh, yes. Do you want to talk a little bit about it? Okay. So it really started during the pandemic. So I have an interest in uh, Tokipona, which is the uh, minimalist conlang uh, that everybody's heard of if they've heard of minimal minimalist conlangs at all. <laughs> and I've done a few little projects that I've been interested in. And so what I started with, uh, really, was an introduction to non-Euclidean geometry in Tokipona, just to prove that it could be done. Um, and then as time wore on in the pandemic, I got more re-interested again in language teaching and language learning methods, because I saw people around me who were trying to learn Turkish, trying to learn English. And I knew from experience how frustrating it is to start with a method or an app or whatever and you really knock yourself out with it and it just doesn't give you what you were hoping for and there's there's something missing and you, you don't know what it is and, and, and that's a familiar feeling to me and i read uh stephen Krashen's book principles and practice of second language acquisition and that was a real milestone for me and what i decided to do uh during the pandemic was to make a pure comprehensible input course in Tokipona to give people a personal experience of how it really does work, but in the shortest possible time, because, you know, it's a minimalist conlang. So the time you need to experience the effect is much less than with the natural languages. So what exactly is a conlang? Oh, sorry, a constructed language. <laughs> constructed. Okay, yeah. Yes. So that would be a language like Esperanto that's made by a person and yes. not one that is, has developed naturally organically. Yes. Yes, that's correct. Yes. Yes. And when so, you say that Takipona is a minimalist conlang, what do you mean by that? Okay. So, so, yes. Most people are probably familiar with something like Esperanto. Okay. I wanted to make a comparison. All right. Well, I, I'm not really an expert on Esperanto. Uh, I do know that Esperanto uh, has made an effort to dispense with some of the, let's say, frilly bits of natural languages that you don't really need. Uh, so my understanding is that Esperanto is easier to, to learn and master than uh, any given natural language because of that. So you don't have like, irregular verbs and such. Um, the minimalism of Tokipona is, is really seeing how much mileage you can get with the smallest number of features possible. So Tokipona, uh, at least the quote unquote official version in, in the book, uh, The Language of Good by Sonia Lang, which came out in 2014, consists of 120 words with three optional extras in a way, kind of synonyms as they were defined. 
Uh, the current tally in the Tokipono community is 137, if, um, if I'm not wrong, uh, which again is a very, very small number. So it's a tiny, tiny lexicon. And the grammar is really as simple as it could possibly be, almost. So there's no suffixes, there's no inflection, there's no gender, obviously. And so it really is a, um, it's almost a toy language, if you like. And I find this concept fascinating because, of course, in the beginning, I don't want to say it was a bit of fun, that would mischaracterize it, but it was supposed to be a cute little language, let's put it that way. Almost, almost like uh, a, a way to get away from, from the uh, maddening complexity of the modern world. And even in the book by Sonia Lang, it says, well, this, this language isn't really suitable for complex subjects. So, of course, I'm a translator and I deal with knotty translation problems all the time because my language pair is English-Turkish. So Turkish, as, you, as you, I'm sure you know, it has a very different background to Indo-European languages. And in any case, as with any language pair, there are certain thoughts that you express in completely different ways, at least in a grammatical sense, between two languages. And I said to myself, no, this, no, 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 no. Information theory. <laughs> Chinese has thousands of characters. Um, we, in English, use an alphabet with only 26 letters fundamentally and yet both are still capable of being full languages and writing down anything you want so why not with 120 words of course you know information theory tells us that the information carrying capacity of an individual word is going to be very low in the same way as in binary the number one can carry less information than the number one in a phone number uh, but, you know, why not? Let's see how far we can take it. So I, um, I I have a blog, and as I say, I did a video on the most technical subject I could think of in the moment, <laughs> just to demonstrate it could be done. So it was like an experiment with 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 that. So that's the minimalism of Tokipon and, and how I've played with it, if you like. Interesting. And <clears throat> your channel, what exactly is your YouTube channel about? What's it about? Well, the tagline is, I want to say everything that's in my head using Tokipona, in Tokipona. Um, but uh, the, the biggest thing in it now is the comprehensive input course I, I, I talked about. So it's 30 videos, 20 minutes each, with me telling stories in Tokipona. Okay, so it's essentially... There's a lot of stuff in Tokipona, but uh, I think what your your channel is renowned for is that CI course. Yeah. That's what people tend to think of. But there's more to it than that, it sounds like. So why might Tokipona be a good L2 for somebody who only speaks one language? Well, the experience of learning your first, second language if I can put it like that, can be uh, a boulevard of broken dreams. <laughs> In the sense that I think, or at least speaking from personal experience, when you've grown up only speaking one language, you can have certain assumptions. You can assume that all languages are just relaxes of each other. You know, it's the same word order. It's just you switch out the word in your language with the word in that language. And that's all it is. It's it's a very I've seen, common... I've seen I've seen that firsthand. I used to work um, in a store, a small shop, and I was like the night manager. I one time had a customer discussing sign language, and he seemed to assume that sign ASL American Sign Language was simply signed English, manually signed English. Yes. And he seemed to have assumed all languages functioned exactly like English, just with different words. Isn't it fascinating 
how even people who get out of that way of thinking with spoken languages can still think that like that for sign languages. I, I've seen that as well, which is unfortunate. Because if anything, it's the sign languages that can do things in a completely unexpected way. <laughs> but back to the point, sorry. So I think Tokipona being a kind of mini language is a really good uh, sandbox, if you like, to see what it's like to learn another language. And of course, for me, I think Tokipona is a really unique opportunity to try an input heavy method or even a pure input method. Uh, because if you want to try that, let's say with ALG for Thai, for instance, right now you can. Uh, you can also do that with Spanish uh, because the materials are out there. But for many languages, the comprehensible input that's out there, there's not really enough of it, and especially with the smaller languages. So, and in any case, it takes so long that to actually take the plunge and go for a method like that, you need to really believe in the method because in the beginning, it's like nothing's happening. So what I would like to suggest to language learners is to give this a go. And even if you're not interested in Tokipana, even if you're not interested in the conlang, which I get, you know, I totally get it that, you know, constructed languages are not really of interest to many people. Um, the point here is not Tokipana. The point is to experience how your brain reacts to comprehensible input, such that then if you want to take that and scale that experience up for another language, it's not just that, you know, some book told you so, or some experts tell you that it's, that it works if you just stick with it. You actually have a personal experience to go on and, and be confident that yes, you know, it will work. I just need time. How did you get into ALG or automatic language growth? You mentioned oh. earlier that you sort of have stumbled upon a couple of different learning techniques and landed on uh, Krashen's comprehensible input hypothesis. Well, if I can't quite remember, it's all a bit of a blur, but I think I discovered Krashen through Wikipedia. Um, and I think I discovered ALG through Wikipedia as well. And the, the whole story of, of J Marvin Brown and how he kind of bashed his head against a brick wall with all the traditional methods and he discovered Krashen and then he, he even out crashened Krashen, if you like, because he, he took uh, Krashen's approach, which was more or less not tied down, but uh, constrained by the classroom environment. And he said, well, let's take just, just the input piece of the whole thing and just run with it as far as we can. And, and ALG was the result. And, you know, it's, it's, it's fascinated me, uh, the ALG, because it is sound. People have learned languages this way. And, well, you've got Dreaming Spanish now, which is basically ALG, and people are learning Spanish. And you can go onto Reddit and find no end of people saying, oh, yeah, it's great, you know, you just keep going and, th and then it all works, it all, it all clicks kind of thing. Um, and I tried it a little bit myself with beginning level Russian. I mean, I've only done maybe 40, 50 hours of, of, of Russian on, on YouTube with, with these uh, comprehensible input channels. And I haven't been able to really keep it up, but I've experienced how it, how it, it is starting to work, if you like. Um, but I, I felt that maybe the biggest hurdle for somebody might be this whole confusion of, well, if ALG is really the way to go, and if the input hypothesis is really correct, then why isn't this mainstream? And, and, and I totally get why people would think that. I thought, hey, you know what? Let's just give people a taster using Tokipona. Um, and then when you have a personal experience of something, you don't need any kind of, um, you, you don't need anybody to prove it to you because you've already experienced it. You know what works because you've experienced it. So one thing that you mentioned in our, our sort of our pre-interview uh, chatting was uh, your video playlist. Oh, Pilin e Tokipona, is that right? Yeah, that's it. Perfect. And you mentioned that you wanted to give people 
as much of a personalized experience in the shortest time as possible with that series. Can you elaborate on that? Okay. So let's say that you've read up on ALG uh, and you think it looks legit. And you're, let's say you're thinking of learning Spanish, for instance, using ALG. Or maybe you're thinking of uh, another language and you're thinking that, well, you know, dreaming Spanish doesn't exist for this language, but I'll use refold or that kind of a method. And, and I'm not going to do Duolingo. I'm not going to do, uh, I'm not going to go to any classes. I'm not going to study any grammar. Um, well, let's have dreaming Spanish, for example, even with Spanish, even with a language pair like Spanish and English, you need hundreds of hours. And it's a big investment of time with with Opinina Tokipona, this series I've, I've, I've created. It's the, the total is 10 hours. And what I'm recommending is that you just make a little bit of time every day, 20 minutes a day for a month. And then if you like, I can interview you on my channel. I have a little podcast. I've interviewed 10 people so far who have been through it. And we have a little conversation in Tokipona. I mean, for sure, the grammar is a little bit all over the place because I think 10 hours, even for a language like Tokipona, isn't really enough to fully acquire it. But it, it's, it's enough to demonstrate that it has worked. And, and we're able to have a little conversation and understand each other in, 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 in Tokipona. I would say it's maybe A to B1 kind of level. But you know what? It's 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 enough. It's enough. So if you were to do that, I mean, 20 minutes a day for a month, you know, a total of 10 hours. I mean, what have you got to lose? What have you got to lose? As as a language learner, if if you're serious about working out what really works and, and finding out what you know is really effective, and you've tried different methods and and there have been a number of methods that have failed you. If you've tried Duolingo or just just doing Anki memorization or something like that, or you've just been to classes and you're just about to give up and you're thinking, you know what, maybe I'm just not built for it. Maybe I'm too old. Maybe I just, I'm just no good at languages. Like, no, give me 20 minutes a day for a month and see if I can't change your mind. That's the point. Interesting. Yeah, I've always been a fan of learning something to prove that you can learn. Um, I myself, uh, I've talked about this in the past, stumbled around while language learning. You know, I became interested in languages when I was around 16 years old, and I ran the, the gamut of uh, classes and self-study books and audio tapes. And uh, at some point, when I was in my early 20s, I I decided on Spanish, and I got okay. I'm, I'm conversational to this day in Spanish. Um, and that gave me the confidence to go forward and try tackling other things like Tagalog or Indonesia, things that are from a distance much more frightening than Spanish. So I do think there's a lot of value in somebody um, learning how to learn via comprehensible input, as it were even if it is Takibona and not necessarily a, a, a natural language. Well, the benefit of Tokipona is that you can you, you can feel it working and you have demonstrable results in just 10 hours. Like you'll know from experience that, that 10 hours is a drop in the ocean, really. Um, and in a way, that's the big bummer <laughs> of, of comprehensible input. It's like the good news is it doesn't have to hurt. The bad news is it's going to take you hundreds of hours. Uh, and there is, yeah, there is no shortcut really. Spanish and I'm not super familiar with Marvin J. Brown and his take on ALG, but Pablo from Dreaming Spanish was very much inspired by ALG and Marvin Brown. And he believes it takes at least a thousand hours of CI, you know, comprehensive input. So it does take time. Yeah. That's the that's the reality. And I used to be a language teacher. And one very interesting thing I noticed was um, there's a certain class of learner who is moneyed, as it were. They're wealthy. 
Very rich. And I would have the occasional uh, rich person, for better, uh, lack of a better word, who they were so used to being able to buy things. They want a car, they buy it. They want a, a, a plane, they buy it. And it infuriated them to no end that they couldn't buy fluency. Yeah. Um, very often this type of learner would book me multiple sessions a week, sometimes daily, and you would think they would be making progress, but that's it. That's the extent of their learning. 30 minutes a day with me, you know, five days a week, without any additional time investment on their, their part. So, you can't buy fluency, it's going to take time. It's my yes. roundabout way of, uh, of making a point there. Yeah. Now, go ahead. No, sorry. Just, um, it's a little bit like getting a personal trainer to get fit. You can't buy fitness. I mean, there may be a benefit to having a personal trainer, but that personal trainer cannot do those push-ups for you, can't run the marathon for you. And and it, like what you're saying, people, people think they can buy these things. Uh, but um, I just today I thought of an, an idea of um, a way of putting it. It's like a get fluent quick scheme. You know, these get rich quick schemes, like they, they, they talk about it like that. Um, and, and we all know really that if it's, if it looks like it's too good to be true, then, then it probably is. Uh, oh, just give me a little bit of money and, and I'll make all your financial dreams come true. And unfortunately, I think a lot of people still have it in their heads that there is a shortcut out there. It was in my head for a long time, you know, that there must be some kind of, you know, magic method. There has to be a magic method out there. Maybe somebody's found it. If I just look hard enough, I'll find it. I remember being in somebody's house with a broadband connection when I was like 16 and spending maybe hours and hours and hours looking for, you know, these a language learning method, the, the magic method. It's just not there. And, and any kind of, like I said, get fluent quick schemes. They, it, and maybe what you need is a, a time investment consultant. <laughs> Maybe that would help you, uh, but ultimately there's there's no quick fix here. But when you have an experience of what does work, I think that can instill confidence somewhat, you know, because you don't want to accept that you know it's going to be a long journey. But if you can if you can be shown that yes, the journey is a long journey, but you know what, you will get there. You will get there. Don't you worry. Just give it time, and it will it will work out. Yeah, and it's interesting how you phrase it, get fluent quick schemes, because those are certainly real. A number of services claim to get you fluent in three, six, nine months, um, when the reality is, for most people, it will take longer. Well, how many hours are there in a day? If, if, if you 24. could... <laughs> well, imagine that you could do, let's say, eight hours of CI a day. That might be a reasonable number. Let's say, you know, time, m money was no object. Let's say, as you said, you know, you, you have all the money there is. Uh, you don't need to worry about working. Reasonably, without getting bored, how much comprehensible input a day could you do? It's like eight, eight, eight hours. I mean, let's say 10, just for the sake of the back of the envelope calculation. Uh, 10 times 100, that's 100 days. That's three months. Just over three months, no, three and a bit maybe maybe you could do it and i think whenever there is somebody who's let's say moved to a new country and has got very fluent very fast very often you'll find that they were in an environment where they were being told what to do and they could see what was going on around them and you know that there was a kind of forced communication there so everybody had to make themselves understood let's say they were an immigrant and they were working and they, and they just had to make it work somehow. Yeah, they were getting a lot of comprehensible input on a daily basis because they had to, because they were working all the hours they were. And they had to, you know, work out how to do what was expected of them in that environment. So yeah, you get fluent pretty quick. But why? Because you're getting dozens and dozens of hours of uh, comprehensible input a week. 
yeah, and unfortunately that's uh, not always the case. Oftentimes people will move to the country and then they will not have any time for learning the language. Or they move to the country and they quickly find sort of an, uh, an enclave where they can be among people who speak their own language. Now, yeah. when it comes to um, grammar, I think you have a very interesting take. The quote is, explicit learning doesn't work. Do you want to elaborate on that point for us? Okay. Why does right. explicit learning not work? Why is grammar a post hoc type thing? Okay. Well, I, I did a video called Grammar Doesn't Exist. And yeah, the title, it, 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 it is designed to grab attention. I'll grant you that. But it is, I feel, a fair representation of the point I'm making, which is that grammar isn't something that you should get into your head. Uh, grammar is a description, an imperfect description, an imperfect rationalization of what we see going on with language. And, and that's always been the case. So in the past, to learn ancient languages, people would try to analyze the ancient languages and say, aha, this is a verb, this is a noun, this is how they work. And they were describing what they were reading in the literature, in this ancient literature. They took that and they applied it to living languages. And they said, ah, yes, here we have this mathematical description of, of the language, but it's, it's a description. It's something that we have come up with to try and make sense of what we see going on in language. Language itself isn't made of grammar. Um, to cut a long story short, language, what is language? Language is being exposed to the language, being used in context. You identify repeating elements in this language, and then you start to sense patterns among those repeating elements. And then you start using them, or what, even before you start using them, your brain starts to accurately predict uh, what word goes with what and how the words go together. And you, you have a series of aha moments. But deep down, it's not that you've discovered the grammar. Uh, it's, it's just dynamically updating pattern recognition. And that's, that's all it has to be made of. So in this Grammar Doesn't Exist video, I specifically explained how large language models like ChatGPT are really a, a game changer because they're proof of concept that we don't need to have um, any kind of explicitly describable uh, kernel of a grammar system built in at birth. I, it actually turns out that, um, like with these large language models, just pattern recognition by itself is enough to to solve the problem of language, if you like. And what do you need? You need a training set. What is the training set? It's another way of talking about comprehensible input. You just need enough examples of linguistic forms in the presence of meaning that you can work out. And, and your brain over time works out the patterns. And I feel that this is helpful for language learners because it helps you to make a clean break between the explicit knowledge or ideas you might have about how a language works and the actual language itself. So one is the map and one is the territory. The map might help you, but that's not what the language is made of. Uh, it's interesting that you, um, you use the terms explicit and you didn't quite use this term, but implicit knowledge when it comes to a language. Uh, having been a, a language teacher myself, uh, a lot of natives do not have explicit knowledge. You know, they cannot explain things, but yes. they just inherently know. Yes. Very interesting. Well, uh, when you think, well, if, if you take the more, let's say, classicist position, and you say that language I is big issue with some of the classicists and how they think of things. Too often when it comes to non-European languages, I see 
the, the language described post hoc uh, in grammars and it's utterly wrong. Right. Yes. You know, one, one, one common thing I see with Filipino is people talk about adjectives. And as far as I can see, Filipino does not have adjectives. It has oh, right. standing verbs. You know. Um, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So, like, you know, to be angry, the, the word angry is the, 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 the to be is baked into the word, you know, as like a prefix or something. And I see these things referred to adjectives. I'm like, adjectives do not conjugate. You know, this is mm. this is very clearly a verb. It acts like a verb. It looks like a verb. Right. Yeah. It is a verb that means to be angry, to have reddened, right? To be red, to become red. And yeah. um, I do take issue with some of the uh, the way people look at Latin or something, and they they try to apply that view to other languages. That's one of my little nitpicks because I see it a lot. And I'm like, this is very clearly a verb, you know. This is very clearly this word, you know, totally different than how it's being described and conceptualized. Yes, yes. Well, if you believe that deep down language has a quasi mathematical structure, let's put it that way. If if you believe that deep down language really is. Uh, a system of categories of abstract entities that interact and, and vocabulary just comes along and, and, and plays by those rules, then the input hypothesis is very counterintuitive. Because what you're saying is language is an explicitly describable system, that that's what it really is. It, consists of ideal forms, which at least in principle can be grappled with and described in an explicit way, but you can't really master a language by analyzing it and by being consciously aware of all of its parts and how they function. You need to get comprehensible input. And when you look closely at the definition of comprehensible input, it's where you can work out what's going on and what people are thinking and why they're saying what they're saying, but what they're saying itself, you've got no idea where one word ends and the next begins to begin with, but your you know, unconscious mind just takes that and works out the language. It just doesn't make sense. Why should an explicitly describable system be something that we can only implicitly acquire? But if you say that the explicit system doesn't actually exist, it's just our way of making sense of this, you know, very mysterious thing that we call language and that those and that it's basically pattern recognition based on let's call it a training set then everything makes sense because language is not actually explicitly describable in a full sense if, if you if you if you come to that position where you're saying you know what language is not explicitly describable in a complete sense then comprehensible input makes all the sense in the world yeah, uh, that implicit knowledge gap, uh, I think is very important. Yes. But when, when you talk, to, when, when Krashen talks about it, I mean, of course, here I'm going to <laughs> diverge from Krashen a little bit. Of course, Krashen um, is very much with Chomsky. And, and, and Chomsky is, well, the, the father of universal grammar. You know, he does say that there is something in something inherently linguistic that we're all born with and the fundamental structure of language is, is inbuilt. And what Krashen will say is that, well, you know, all of the grammar rules that have been discovered are like this big circle and the grammar rules that the, gra that the teachers know are a small a circle within the circle and, and the grammar rules that you can cover in a classroom environment are an even smaller circle. So it's not efficient to teach grammar. And, but of course, when he uses the word discover, I assume he uses the word discover, the implication there is that if we keep going, one day we will discover all the rules of grammar. One day we will fully discover the language. And, and what I want to propose is that it's a category error. You, you are not discovering, you know, grammar is not a process of discovery. Grammar is a process of modeling. You know, let's say you have a model of the weather. You know, we, we do not discover laws of the weather i mean for sure you know there's physics and, and so on but when you're trying to model the weather all you're thinking about is does this model predict 
does this model describe what we're looking at? When we use this model, is it useful? Does it give us useful predictions? Have we, you know, discovered more of the weather? One day will we completely be able to represent the full weather system within our model? It's 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 a non-starter because it's a model. It's it's not the real thing. Do you, do you, do you see what I mean there? It's just I, I I feel like it's important to make this 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 break with the idea that you know language is something that is an an inherently you know ideal form kind of mathematical interaction kind of a, a system right and you mentioned the the large language models the llms sort of again like you said modeling it's in the name and they do it simply by internalizing a whole bunch of comprehensible input well yes um something that i read recently there's a paper by Kiefer, I can't remember his first name, that actually came out just before uh, the, uh, the, the, the paper that led to ChatGPT. Um, but it's really good. I mean, if you can wrap your head around it, it's a, it's a PhD um, dissertation, uh, but it's, it's a defense of pure connectionism. And if you only read one bit, read the bits in chapter five, because to summarize, it's like, a thought, a very specific thought in a very specific context is like a point in space. A word is like an area in space that contains all the thoughts that that word could possibly be involved in expressing. When you use a sentence, all the words in the sentence kind of cancel each other out and there's a very small region of thought space that they all kind of cover. And what is translation? Translation is taking the sentence, using those words to cancel each other out, such that then you have a very tiny, tiny region of thought space. And then what you do is you say, well, what combination of words in the other language would cover the same region and thought space? And that's what the translation is, because obviously originally um, GPT was conceived as a translation uh, system. So when you think of it that way, <laughs> then that means that every word is like a unique shape in thought space. And the only way to really get all the contours of that shape is to experience it for yourself. So I know that ChatGPT, they, they tell us that it was it's mostly trained on English and not to trust it for other languages. Does it know Takiba? No. No, it's and um, no, no, it's it's no good at Tokipana. And I think there, there are two problems with Tokipana. Although in its defense, ChatGPT is also very good at Turkish. And I even interacted with it in a spoken Arabic dialect. I don't know how familiar you are with the Arabic dialects, but uh, the, the... Very sorry? divergent, essentially. Speaking yes. Languages. Well, pretty much. And also... The way that, like in Lebanon, the, Le the Lebanese dialect is very often written with a what's sometimes called Arabish. So, because you can't represent the full Arabic alphabet with the Roman alphabet, you've got numbers instead of the Arabic letters. So, instead of Ain, you've got a three, and sometimes instead of Chai, you've got a five, and things like that. Of Hamza, you've got a two. Right, very good, very good. And you know, it can it can string a sentence together. It's not totally coherent in terms of the meaning but uh you can you can have a, a weird kind of conversation with it in this in this kind of you know this this form of spoken arabic that the kids use to text each other right it's even good at that the thing with tokipona is the training set for tokipona is going to be very very small there's not an awful lot that's been written in tokipona to date um what has been written in tokipona to be perfectly honest, I mean, a lot of people will learn the words of Tokipana. They will learn the grammar rules, which are simple, but they are not like English at all. And then what they will do is they will string a sentence together that doesn't mean what they think it means. <laughs> so I think even if it has had the full, even if, if Ch you know, ChatGPT has been able to access everything ever written in Tokipana, a lot of it will have thrown it off. And of course, the other problem with Tokipana is that 
Um, to express complex thoughts in Tokipona, you do not have complex vocabulary. You have to um, dance around the subject in a, in, in, in a sense. Now, it is, I'm quite sure that given a large enough training set, the, um, the, the approach used in GPT would, would crack that particular nut. But you just don't have the training set for it. Tokipon is very interesting um, yeah. because its claim to fame, like you mentioned, is that it has a very narrow vocab. Yeah. But then they make up for it by essentially deriving new vocab from fixed, you know, sort of collocations, right? Um, mm, not a, quite. A, a, not a quite. A good person would be often the equivalent of a friend, right? Yeah. And, yeah. You know, it's sort of like saying... It's a little dis bit disingenuous. Oh, we only have 200 words or, you know, so on and so forth. But really, certain fixed combinations of words are de facto, you know, meaning another word. Well, you're not wrong in that. When I write in Tokipona, though, I do my best to write in such a way that somebody who's only ever read the official book by Sonia Lang, I say official, but the book by Sonia Lang, and who only knows that core 120 words would still be able to understand me. And that does set a very high bar. And of course, you know, I am influenced by uh, the, the current state of the language as currently used. However, I, I do my best with it to make sure that it is understandable. And like you say, um, there, there is a kind of gravitation towards certain collocations, but they are not... Um, that they're not full lexical items that can take on a life of their own. So to give you an example, you know the word bookworm in English. So you've got the word book and the word worm, and those have become collocated to the point that it's now a completely independent lexical item. Tokipona can't, doesn't quite do that. And I think each word does retain enough independence such that even though there might be a default meaning of a certain collocation, um, you never quite lose track in your perception of Tokipona of, of the individual words. And, and if, you, if you provide enough context, you can, make, you, can, you can assign any new meaning to any given collocation that makes sense, if you see what I mean. So, like what you said, Yanpona means a friend. This is uh, the standard, I say standard, it's a default meaning, it has become a default meaning. But that doesn't mean that you can't pull the phrase Jan Pona in a completely different direction if you want to. So if you're in the context of talking about good people, then you might kind of lay the groundwork for it. That, you know, we're talking about people who do good things and who give good feelings to others. Such a person is a good person, Jan Pona. And then in that context, Jan Pona doesn't mean friend. Do you, see, do you see what I mean there? You know, that there are default meanings that have kind of settled down to a point. Uh, but Tokipona hasn't lexified those to, to such a great extent that, that you can't use things in a way that's intuitive if you just take the words uh, in their original meanings. Now, you mentioned the, the Sonia Lang book came out in 2013? 14. 2014. Yeah. I had no clue that Tokipona was under a decade old. No, no, no. Tokipona is much older than that. So Tokipona okay. was originally posted on uh, some kind of message board in 2000, 2001, sorry. Okay, that, so, that tracks. 2001, the original proposal comes out, then there's Yahoo message boards, or forums, I can't remember what they were called. <laughs> and then that kind of goes through various, you know, mutations. And then 2014 is a kind of, is a line in the sand really, because that was the first time that Sonia Lang actually formally published a version of the language. Okay. That's why I'm calling it the quote unquote official book, because Tokipona has, right from 2001, has always had a grassroots quality to it. So even in the book, The Language of Good, um, Sonia was very careful to say that, you know, this is a living language and this is just my version of it and other people have their own take on it. Um, and and, and it's, it's, it's good because Sonia's been very 
um, very relaxed about her um, interactions with the community and the language. She hasn't been dictatorial at all. And honestly, I think that personality and that um, attitude has been as much of a force for for the success and, you know, spread of Tokipona as the structure of the language itself. So taking a step back here and looking back at your project, Opilene Tokipona. Yeah. Um, what goes into making an episode for you or uh, a video? How, how did you, you sort of plan around it and how did you design them? Okay, very good. So I decided to use a, um, a variant of the story listening method. Um, so it's, it comes recommended by the big man himself. <laughs> um, no, no, Krashen. Krashen, okay. Yeah. So Krashen and uh, Mason are, are very, um, they're, they're, they're very, they're, they work together quite closely on that. Uh, Krashen has always recommended uh, story listening. And he's recommended it because it is very close to the the, the concept that the original concept that the point of comprehensible input is that you can understand the meaning. And so there's no focus on form or focus on forms at all. It's just providing the inputs and allowing the students brains to figure it out. Um, and so I decided to take that method and adapt it a little bit for YouTube. So um, she often uses Vinico Mason often uses Aesop's fables, things like that, because they're familiar stories uh, and, and they do have a kind of um, mesmerizing quality to them, if you like. You know, you, you can get into the story and especially with younger students, I suppose. Um, but and, and also they're internationally recognized, they're timeless to the test of time, as they say. So the first 20 stories are Aesop's fables or adaptations of them. Uh, the last 10, I decided to talk about real you events. The one with the crow. All oh, right. <laughs> the one with the crow. The, the, there are crow crows in a lot of them. <laughs> Which see. one with the crow? Um, something about there's like water in a jug. And no, I didn't do that. Reach, can't reach the water. So it puts pebbles in there until the water level raises. Uh, no, no, I didn't do that one. I did the one where he um, he takes some um, peacock feathers, okay, sticks them in his own plumage and pretends he's a peacock, and the peacocks don't want him, and his friends don't want him because he thinks he's better than them. I, I did that one. The Aesop's fables, sir. Um, you know, it's interesting just, how they've stuck with me because yeah, I remember reading these and. Oh, like, I don't want to say primary school, but primary school, maybe. I remember yeah. my, my social studies course or something going through several of them. And yeah. uh, they stick with you. They really do. They do. They do. They do. There's a kind of, I, I you know, I think, um, well, that's a whole other subject, but uh, there's a kind of um, universal quality to them that kind of resonates psychologically. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's why they've, they've, they have been told, you know, throughout the ages. But, you know, I think um, I, I, for the last 10, I wanted to do kind of real events and real people um, just to give it a bit of variety. Uh, and, and also, I don't know, I, I think Aesop's fables, yeah, they're really good and you it's especially with the beginning stages you can use them because they are so familiar and everybody's everybody knows more or less where the story's going right and that does help with it being more comprehensible but i, I do think um something that's current is also needed but anyway so i i had my so gone so the first few uh videos are the Aesop's fables but the last 10 you mentioned were more current do you want to elaborate on what you mean by like current? Okay, well, I did. I, I told stories about some people, some famous people. So, for example, Mary Curie, 
I talked, I did one where I talked about Mary Curie's story. I did one about, uh, the Apollo 13 episode, you know, that almost disaster and how they saved the astronauts on Apollo 13. And I also did one about, you know, my wife and I trying to find a place to stage in, in some, in somewhere we went on holiday during the pandemic, you know, things like that. Just all, all you need is something with a bit of tension and resolution. And it's like, what's going to happen next? If, if you can get, have a kind of what's going to happen next and curiosity in, in the story, then you can use anything really. I, I think there's, there's a, there's a lot of variety that's possible. Um, but yeah, it does take a bit of work to think about what you're going to say. You do need a story to tell, uh, no matter what the story is, even if it's your story, you know, you need to know where you're going in your mind such that there is a conclusion. Um, yeah. Now, Joel, we're nearing yeah. the end of the hour, but before yes. we hit that, that hour mark, and we say goodbye. Were there any topics that you would have liked to have discussed that I didn't touch on? Well, thank you. Um, not, not really. I suppose it's just that this, this little course that I've made, Opilina Tokipona, I'm not, I, it's, it's just an experience that I think every language learner should have. And it doesn't matter really where you are what method you're thinking of using uh you know whatever you end up doing in the future let's say you're using refold right now you could take a break and do this and then go back to refold or, or whatever it is but I, I really feel that too often language learners uh get get scammed out of their self-confidence or they get started with something like refold or some kind of input heavy approach, but they find it difficult to focus on the meaning. And there's this constant anxiety that they're missing something in, in the words. It's like, maybe I need to work it out. So I think, you know, this is an experience. It's, it doesn't break the time bank. It's really easy to do. It's just 20 minutes a day for a month or however you want to do it. You could do two a day, for two weeks, whatever. But, you know, if you can just look at it as an investment, you know, nothing risk, nothing gained. But, you know, what have, what have you got to lose, really? Just give it a go and, and just experience how your subconscious mind really does take that input. And so long as you can work out what the thought is, your brain is paying attention. I, I, there, there's a, there's a real, it, it's almost exhilarating in a way when, when you realize that your brain did something for you. I think it's, it's a beautiful experience in a way. I think it's part of what makes us human. So even if you're not interested in learning language, I think it's a fascinating thing to do. But if you are interested in learning language, then, you know, this is just something really easy to do. And yeah, this is my little contribution to the language learning and teaching community in, in general. And yeah, that's it really. <laughs> I'm not an academic. I'm not making any money out of this. This is a, a passion project of mine. And if people benefit from it, then you know, that, that makes me happy. Sure. Well, we'll put a link to Opilini Tokipona and your channel in the description and hopefully some of the listeners are coming away from this with, hey, Takipona's a thing, and hey, uh, maybe I should uh, give myself a shot at learning this and, and experiencing uh, sort of comprehensible input and what it's like to actually acquire a language. Yeah, Especially us, us dirty Anglophones. We tend to be very guilty of making it to adulthood without actually having any level of skill I was talking to a Scottish person uh, yesterday or the day before. He's like, yeah, I took French for seven years and can't string together a sentence, you know? Yeah. And, and that's the point. It's not your fault. You were sold a dud, right? <laughs> you are good at it. Your brain is built for it. You just need to experience it. And, and then you're away.
Joel, thank you so much for coming on. This was a really fun episode for me. And well, thank you for having me. I enjoyed myself I, as well. I would love to have you back on, actually, this time with a focus on Turkish and right. talking about, you know, being a professional translator, uh, working with Turkish and some of the other Turkic languages. Because you, they're they're very closely related, and there's a whole bunch to pick apart there. Yeah, anytime. Thank you, yeah, Azerbaijani Turkmen. All right, Joel. Thank you so much, and take care. Look after yourself. Thanks very much. I want to thank you for listening to this episode of the Refold Podcast. If you're watching the live premiere, you're in luck. Right as it ends, we have an after party over on the Refold Central Discord server. Come join us by using refold.link forward slash join and chat about the episode. If you enjoyed the podcast and would like to hear more, you can find older episodes to listen to on YouTube and Spotify. Let us know what you thought about the video by liking and leaving a comment below. Do you have suggestions for upcoming visitors or requests for particular topics? Please feel free to reach out to me on Discord at georgepig hashtag 5413 or via email at clayton at refold.la. Thank you all for watching and or listening, and I'll see you next week. Hey, as you know, there's a lot of language learning advice out there, which can make it kind of overwhelming and difficult to actually get going on your own learning. If you feel like you're struggling to figure out language learning, you're not alone. It's an extremely complicated process with tons of different steps. If you're looking for a step-by-step -step guide to create the perfect language learning routine for you, then you have to check out our new course. We spent thousands of hours designing a simple and straightforward process that you can use to create your own personalized language routine that actually works. We understand that every learner is different and that you have to roll with the punches and adapt. Every day for 30 days, I walk you through everything you need to know to build an effective learning routine, no matter your circumstances. We give you the advice and resources you need to ensure your success, so you don't have to waste time looking for stuff to do and can focus on learning. And if any questions do come up, don't worry. We are always there to answer any questions and clear up confusion. And it's all backed by our 90 day, no questions asked money back guarantee. If for whatever reason, something's not quite working for you, we insist you get every penny back. It's time for you to stop wishing that you could learn a second language. It's time to become the master of your language learning journey. Check out the link below to get instant access and start your journey today.